Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight with Dr. Dan Brandt. Dr. Brandt will be reviewing the basics of CBCT, specifically focusing on perio and ortho diagnosis and treatment. My name is Adam, and I'm happy to be your moderator. We are offering CE credit for tonight's webinar. Towards the end of the webinar, I will paste a CE link into the chat for you to access and complete. If you do want CE, it is required you complete the survey. If you don't have access to the chat during tonight's webinar, or if you have any other CE-related questions, please email webinars at henryshine.com. All right, Dr. Brandt, take it away. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so excited for you to be joining me, where, whether you're in Indonesia, Canada, anywhere, East Coast, West Coast, welcome tonight. We're going to have a fun evening talking about CBCTs and my two beloved specialties of perio and ortho. Uh, Daniel Brandt, board certified specialist in periodontics and orthodontics, and it is my great pleasure to be coming to you live from New York. It's Tuesday Night Live with Henry Schein, and I am excited to be sharing knowledge. I want it to be engaging, entertaining, and most importantly, educational. So if you guys want, go ahead and take a screenshot. This is the most important slide of tonight. This contains the information that is the take home message, if you will. Now, no, your internet is not lagging. I'll get a little bit of help here from a cone beam CT and with some digital irradiation, hopefully we'll be able to expose the take home message so you can better see it. And essentially what the take home message is that what we cannot see, we cannot diagnose. Now that might still be a little bit difficult. So if we go ahead and adjust the contrast, we can better see the message. Now the corollary of this, what we can see, we can diagnose is predicated upon the fact that we would require the proper education or knowledge and technology. And so with that being said, I am excited to speak about CBCT or cone beam computed tomography. tomography which I think is one of the 10 game changer uh, in the field of dentistry. Now, we've all heard of the analogy of a tooth to an iceberg where we can only see the top of it. And so what a cone beam CT really does is it allows us not only to be able to see and visualize the root of the teeth, but it also allows us to take cross sections and see the tooth both from a horizontal, vertical, and um, transverse section. So one of the objectives that I want each of you to come away with is understanding the vocabulary that we use when we view CBCTs and the different windows that is uh, visible in a software program. So the first one is coronal. Now coronal, I like to think of a crown on top of your head. So it goes and it's taking sections. CBCTs are a dynamic thing. So I have a video here to showcase us going forward and backwards through this patient's CBCT. So CBCT for coronal view, think crown. Now, my favorite, axial. And I say favorite because I am a Canadian. And so just think of a lumberjack taking the ax horizontally to a tree. And so we're taking horizontal sections of the patient's dentition and skeletal structure. So here you can see us going forward and back or up and down with the patient's left being where that mouse is on the far, I guess if you're looking at it on the right hand screen where you see the cursor going back and forth. So that's the patient's left hand side. And then finally, the last cut is the sagittal. Now the mnemonic for this is I don't have one. So sagittal, you just have to think mid-sagittal plane, and then we're going left to right. This is what we would use if we were to extrapolate from a CBCT, a cephalometric radiograph. But we will get to that shortly. So here we go. In the first five minutes, we have essentially covered first objective. And now you guys are all familiar with the three planes of view. Coronal, like a crown, axial, the ax and sagittal. Now you guys know a little bit about me and the webinar is very difficult to get to know 
you, the audience. So I want to get to know you guys by asking a few questions. The first question of tonight is, do you have a CBCT? And so I'll let Adam run that for a little bit here. If you guys can go ahead and select yes or no. And then Adam, I can't pro progress through the slides until after, so you let me know. Oh, interesting. Good to know. Uh, um, wait, no, I'm, oh, I apologize. There you go. <laughs> uh, looks like we got a 55-45 split in favor of no. So 55 people don't have a CBCT. Perfect. 55 percent. 55 percent don't have a CBCT. Wonderful. You guys are in the right seminar. All right. So 55 percent is no. Now, this one, Adam, just give me a little bit of time before we actually post the uh, the poll. So the second question is, what best describes you? Your first option is a super GP. If you're a general dentist and you are logged in on a Tuesday night to a webinar, after two years of webinars, I guarantee you, you are an incredible GP. And so if that describes you, press A. If you are a specialist, any member of the specialty community, oral surgery, pros, endo, ortho, perio, radiology, anything whatsoever, you're a specialist, or are you a team member? I consider myself extremely blessed to be working with amazing team members in each office that I work at. And it's all about progressing your knowledge. So it's very important that your team members, whether it's a receptionist, front desk, um, assistants, hygienists, all are part of the learning journey with you. Or maybe you're here because you're team Dan. So go ahead and I'll let Adam run this poll for a little bit. Not a lot of team Dan, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> so so my, my mom hasn't joined the webinar yet. <laughs> that's funny that's okay i hope they choose specialists or super gps or team member over team dan but yes it's looking like uh roughly 45 percent super gp 30 percent specialist 22 percent team member wow and a measly six percent 12 people for team dan hey 12 <laughs> people that's good I, I i appreciate every single one of every single answer so that's amazing and, you know, as, a, as an individual, I used to do general dentistry for three years. So I think it's, it's so important to understand dentistry from all fields of you. And so I'll take a little time here. In his landmark book, Simon Sinek talks about start with why and the importance of basing everything that we do by answering why before what we do. And so let me share with you why I believe um, CBCT is so crucial. And so first of all, it allows me to diagnose properly. It allows me to see things, as we mentioned, that I could otherwise not see. And also, most importantly, allows me to communicate, not only with the referring dentist, other specialists, but also with my patients. It's a lot easier telling Mrs. Jones about the lack of bone or the sinus or the inclination of her teeth while we look at a screen together. And then finally, it allows me to perform at my peak. So it allows me to perform both by allowing me to be prepared before I go into treatment and also render treatment with the highest possible precision. And so the third question I ask is if you don't have a CBCT or if you do and you're wondering, or if you do, you can feel free to answer this. Why do you think dentists don't have CBCTs yet? Do you think it's because of the cost that's prohibitive? Is it the space that's available in their office? Is it concerns about radiation? Or is it another factor? Wow. I tell you what, we got a runaway answer. Really? I will end it and I will share these publicly. So wow. Give, we'll give it a couple seconds here. Let everyone chime in. Got a couple comments in the chat. One person okay. says, I don't feel comfortable interpreting a CBCT. Uh, someone says a combination of all and lack of 3D training, fear of the unknown. Beautiful. Um, all right, I think we've got enough in here. So I will go ahead and share those results. Beautiful. All right, so 
I'm personally not going to be talking about cost. Uh, I will definitely be talking about from radiation to the other concerns that uh, was mentioned that were mentioned in the chat. Uh, fear of the unknown is a great one, uh, especially fear of how it can contribute to your daily practice. And so we'll, we'll be discussing all that this evening. And I appreciate each uh, audience member's participation in this. So let's continue. What are the common uses of CBCTs? So if you're an oral surgeon, you have it for wisdom teeth, orthognathics, and by no means is this an exclusive and exhaustive list. So um, I don't mean to be forgetting anything. Now, if you're an endodontist, you use it for your root canals, and I guarantee it was a game changer for finding that pesky little MBT, MB2. We can use it for apicos, root fractures, ortho. We use it for seeing path of eruption, TMJ, periophenotype, help us in TAD placements, and then perio, and obviously oral surgery and other specialists as well, implants, sinus of guided bone regeneration, and even crown lengthening. Needless to say, you could spend an entire evening speaking about one of those, but for today, we're going to be trying to talk broadly and what the take, uh, what the important message is that even though each specialty has their own kind of niche, niche um, CBCT machine is really the one that brings them all together. Every one of these specialists re, uh, depend on the knowledge and information that can be gathered from a CBCT. Now, we talked a little bit about the different procedures, but the beautiful thing about CBCTs is the spectrum of use from all the way from the diagnosis to the treatment. And I know tonight's uh, lecture was titled Diagnosis and Treatment Planning, but in reality, it could have been Diagnosis, Planning, and Treatment. And so here you can see the different things that a CBCT allows us to diagnose allows us to plan, and then also allows us to treat. And we're going to be discussing things like sleep apnea and airway. We're going to be talking about TMJ disorders briefly. And I'm going to be highlighting several cases and showcasing how the CBCT played a crucial role in providing the treatment. In the final arrow there, the treatment, it's very exciting to see what is being used and what's being created from robotics to surgically navigated treatment options and also in the use for PET and tooth transplantation. But first, safety. And so if we were to talk about safety, the best resource that I can recommend is the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology. They have position papers that highlight things from endo uses, ortho, perio, implants, everything. So I urge you to refer to that. Now, in terms of what we always learned in dental schools, a LARA principle, trying to utilize radiation as infrequently as possible. And in 2013, the American Academy of Maxillofacial Radiologists came up with a lot of, which is to encourage us to use the technology available, but as low as diagnostically acceptable. And so if you have a two-dimensional option that's emitting less radiation and still allowing you to diagnose it, then that would be favorable over unnecessarily radiating someone with a cone beam CT. Now, unfortunately, as everyone knows, it's not that simple. And there are several factors that we have to consider when deciding when to utilize a CBCT. There are settings within the program itself, like field of view, resolution, kilowatts and milliamperes, but also patient consideration. As an orthodontist, I see a lot of kids. Kids have developing um, organs and they're growing and you obviously wanna minimize the cumulative amount of radiation that they're exposed to. Also, we have to think about the area that we're irradiating and also, the size of the patient. Now, there are several other factors, but I want us to get that conversation um, established. The, we have to use our best judgment and remember that we have control over all of this stuff. The most important factor is to consider why am I taking a CBCT? And so let's talk more specific. So 
If we look at this banana, it contains 0.1 micro sieverts of radiation. And so if we use the spectrum, and this is based off a study in 2010, eating a banana is a point, about 0.1 micro sieverts. So that goes on the far left. Now, what is the fatal dose of radiation? So the fatal dose is around 10,000 millisieverts. So 1,000 micro sieverts equals one millisievert. Now, this is not a math class. Uh, so I won't do the calculation and let you know that it takes about 100 million bananas to reach that fatal dose of radiation. We'll turn it to something more practical. How much is in one single dental x-ray? And in the particular example, it's approximately five microsieverts. And so we can go ahead and place that over there on the far left. Now, what about a cone beam CT? So... In this particular paper, they cited 70 micro sieverts. Now there's an asterisk there because we're gonna be talking more detail about how you get to that number. And so the question everyone likes to know is how does that compare to a flight? And in my case, if I was to fly out to the Super Bowl and I wanna know how much radiation, the flight from New York to LA commercial flight is approximately 40 micro sieverts. And so to get an idea of how much radiation we're exposed to on a yearly basis, the natural background radiation per year is around two millisieverts, okay? Now, to go back to this asterisk, the reason we have this asterisk is because nowadays we have the ability to use ultra low dose programs with the newer cone beam technology. Let me just return that for a second here. And so it wants to be pesky. So what we can see here is that you can take a dual jaw, 10 by 10 centimeter at an ultra low dose, and you're only exposing your patient to 17.4 micro sieverts. For a pediatric patient, a five by five is even less than a PA. Now this is a conversation that I want you to have with your CBCT rep and making sure that you're not erating unnecessarily. The nice thing too is the fact that a CBCT doesn't have overlap. So if we think about a full mouth series taking multiple PAs or bite wings, there is some overlap and excessive information that we're gaining while still irradiating the patient. The nice thing about a CBCT is that it's only a single section and you get all that information with no overlap. And so to take the... Uh, to drive home the message, essentially what I want us to remember is that we have to radiate responsibly. We have to have careful consideration of the who, the when, and most importantly, the why. Always be asking yourself, if this was me, if this was my child, if this is what was my parent, assuming you love your children and your parent and yourself, would you want to be exposed to the radiation because of the information that you're able to get? So sometimes you want to consider two-dimensional over the 3D. And then finally, the importance of diagnosis. So a question that's often asked is, if I didn't see it or I don't know about the brainstem or, or the sinus, am I still responsible to diagnose it? And the answer in the court of law is undoubtedly yes, 100%. If you can visualize it on the screen through the x-ray, through the CBCT, you are responsible for it. And so I want to introduce you to, there is a company called Beam Readers. And so you can send that to them or other oral and maxillofacial radiologists in your state to help with the interpretation of the cone beam CT. What I like to say to patients is, if, I, if I'm looking at a certain area and we captured more and I'm not sure of something, you can offer the patient, look, I'm a specialist in this particular area. There are specialists that spend their entire day looking at every single slice and section of this. Would it interest you to send it off to them? And then you can discuss with them any affiliated costs in the process from there. So I encourage you to check Beam Readers out and also to remember, radiate responsibly and that we are responsible for what we're diagnosing. And now for the exciting part, let's talk some cases. And so case one is a patient that comes to you, came to me with the chief concern, I broke my front tooth again. 
And so this patient broke her tooth four times, same crown kept coming off. And so she came to me with zero interest, unfortunately, of trying to save it, even though that is my true love is saving teeth. And so as we look at her mouth, the one thing that pops into any implantologist's uh, brain when it's a front tooth is, please don't have a high smile line, which unfortunately she does. And so if we take a closer look here, we can see that the patient's tooth is fractured, but she has a very healthy carinized tissue. And despite the recession, she is a candidate for um, anterior implant. Sorry, so I wanna talk briefly about periodontal phenotype. As some of you might know, in 2017, the American European Federations of Perio got together and they came up with a new consensus report. And so periodontal phenotype consists of gingival biotype and bone morphotype. So the official term when we discuss is periodontal phenotype and that is made out of both the gingival biotype and bone morphotype. Furthermore, gingival biotype includes gingival thickness. And a quick way to see whether it's thin or thick is utilizing a probe. So here you can see a probe being placed inside the sulcus. And if you can see the show through, then it would be classified as a thin gingival, thin gingival thickness. If you can see the probe, like in this example here, it would be considered thick. The other factor in gingival biotype is carinized tissue width. So if we take a look at this patient here and we measure from the gingival margin to the mucogingival junction, we can see it approximately two millimeters. And so, one second. You can ignore the less than one millimeter, greater than one millimeter, that's for gingival thickness. Um, so here on the far left, we can see someone who has a non, very thick band of uh, carinized tissue. Now, this patient did receive a free gingival graft. And the reason I included it in this is that the periodontal phenotype can be altered and can be changed. And so a thin can go into thick, and so when we look at this patient of ours, we can assume that she has a very thick gingival biotype due to the thickness. And since it was Valentine's Day yesterday and I was looking at this, this is a little hard because there's no such thing as too much tissue in a periodontist eye. Now, what about bone morphotype? Well, we can take a PA and we can see that this tooth has a root canal on it, but we in order to diagnose bone morphotype, we do need a CBCT. And so according to the World Workshop, approximate 0.3 is thin, 0.75 is thick. But even though we can only measure it with a CBCT, the recommendation, it's very uh, strongly positioned that we don't need to take a CBCT just to diagnose bone morphotype. And so to drive home that, we drop that. And I want to emphasize that just because you want to know a patient's bone morphotype doesn't indicate a reason to take a CBCT. In this case, we are justified to take a CBCT because we need to know what the, to, uh, what the bone is like in order to place our implant. Now, we know from several studies that the facial bone in 90% of cases is less than one millimeter. And in 50% of cases, it's less than 0.5 millimeter. This is the CBCT of our patient who even though had a thick gingival uh, biotype, you can see how thin her bone is on the CBCT. And so let's give a little few tips on taking a CBCT. I like to use an optrogate or a cotton roll inside the sulcus that helps to separate the cheek and better visualize the area that we're working in. A tongue depressor allows uh, the ability to, again, visualize and plan the prosthetic. And then the non-negotiable is always safety first and using a lead vest. So the, sorry, a little bit of a lag here. Now, how accurate is a CBCT? This is something that 
a lot of uh, clinicians talk about. And although we do see differences every now and then, the studies do say that a CBCT is accurate of both the clinical thickness of the labial gingiva and the bone. And furthermore, that there is a correlation, moderate association between the underlying bone radiographically and the thickness of labial gingiva. So if you see a patient with thick labial gingiva, you can assume that there's a good probability that she or he has thick bone. So for the case that we were looking at, we decided to use the dual zone technique published by Dr. Chu, Dr. Tarano, and Team Atlanta. And what it essentially says is that there's two zones that we have to consider when placing implants. The first zone is the tissue zone. And here you can see in the figures that that is the zone uh, coronal to the implant and healing junction. And then apical is the bone zone. So here we see the patient before pre-op atraumatic extraction of the tooth. And then when we were preparing for the surgery, we know that we want to start our osteotomy one third up the palatal wall. And also dual zone technique discusses the importance of having a gap junction. And so here you can see the palatal engagement of the first drill. And we also want to remember that as we're drilling, we have to take into account the gingival thickness and height. And here we see the implant being placed, proper torque, and then we begin the provisionalization of the implant. And so we used a fiber optic shell, plate, positioned it through the uh, temporary abutment, and then added flowable and composite. And so here you can see the provisional implant crown with the contour. And this is a conversation in of itself, the critical and subcritical contours in order to get optimal aesthetic and biologic results. So here we can see the gap of approximately two millimeters that we then use to fill with uh, bone graft. In this particular case, we used uh, bovine bone because we don't need to, uh, we want it to stay there. And here you can see the photo of us placing it and then the temporary crown in place. And then screw channel. And so the patient comes to us with a fractured tooth and then walks away with an implant and a provisional crown. And so the takeaways in regards to CBCT is that CBCT allows us to diagnose the periodontal phenotype, which is both the gingival biotype and bone morphotype. And it also helps in guiding the implant and the prosthetic outcome. And a little tidbit about placing anterior implants is that you want to prepare that osteotomy a third of the way up the palatal wall. So case number two, if we could have spent an entire evening talking about single anterior implant and all the nuances that go into it. We could spend an entire weekend talking about this patient who presented to me with a chief concern that she has terrible jaw pain, she cannot sleep at night, and that she hates her smile. And so through the utilization of a CBCT, I will showcase the treatment that we were able to render her and also treatment plan both with oral surgeons, the per periodontist, and the orthodontist. And so here are her initial photos of how she presents. We're able to utilize the CBCT to gain uh, information uh, to get the CEPH rendering, which allowed us to take all the necessary cephalometric analysis, and then treatment plan, orthognathic surgery, and also the orthodontic movement that's going to be necessary. Now, I, uh, we could talk a lot about jaw joints, but when a patient comes to you with a concern of jaw, you do the initial uh, TMJ analysis. The beautiful thing about a CBCT is it allows us to see in far greater detail than a pan on its own. And so the topic of tonight is not to talk about TMJ disorders, but what we do look at is even though we see the beaking and that this patient has some level of disc uh, condylar resorption, the cortical uh, layer on top is indicative that the resorption has ceased and we are safe to continue with our treatment.
And so this is a very hot topic right now. Are we able to utilize CBCT in diagnosing sleep apnea and airway issues? And so the big thing is that yes, it gives us information and it's very valuable. But in order for us to diagnose sleep apnea, we do have to rely on our medical colleagues and refer the patient to a sleep study polysomnogram uh, in order to confirm sleep apnea. The CBCT does allow us to see the progress of treatment. And one of the things I like to tell patients is there's a difference when you're vertical and taking this x-ray versus when you're lying down in a supine position and the tonicity of the muscles and other factors that go into sleep, uh, sleep apnea and sleep obstructive conditions. Now, this patient went through a lot of treatment. She had TAD expansion, she had Wilkodontic therapy. And so as much as I would like to talk all about her in particular, I'm gonna jump ahead and go through kind of the before and after. And you can see that through the information we gained from the CBCT, which allowed us to diagnose the periodontal phenotype, which allowed us to see and diagnose that she's constricted in the transverse dimension. And we were able to use a CBCT also in our communication with the oral surgeon of how far we want her, jaw, her jaws to move forward. And then finally make sure that all the orthodontic movement is done in a biologically sound manner. And so here we can see the before and after. And also, if we look at the occlusal shots, we can see how nicely we were able to expand her airway, expand her arch, and also align her teeth and provide this patient not only with improved function, decreased pain, improved sleep, also an aesthetic smile that she cannot stop showing off to all her friends. And so the takeaway here is that the CBCT allowed us to diagnose the TMJ issues and provide us with information on whether we need to address those first or if we're clear to progress with treatment. It gives us insight on sleep apnea. It allows us to diagnose the phenotype. It also guides us in our placement of temporary anchorage devices. And most importantly, it allows us to have the interdisciplinary communication And so our last case for this evening is an 11 year old girl who presents to us uh, for orthodontic therapy. And aside from her oral hygiene that we needed to work on and we did, we can see that this patient has two retained primary teeth on the lower left and possibly missing upper premolars and one, uh, first upper premolars. And so we refer, this is a pan that was taken two years prior to her first um, visit to me. And what we can see is that in fact, this patient has a genesis of four teeth, essentially the second upper premolars and both lower left premolars. I wanna draw your attention to this lower right segment where we can see that the root is not fully formed. Unfortunately, when she came to us, these two premolars, the roots were already formed. And so when we take a closer look at the lower right and the lower left, knowing that she was diagnosed by her general dentist to have those baby teeth extracted due to recurrent caries, you have to ask yourself at the age of 11, what are we able to provide this patient to maintain that space because, you know, most certainly she's not a candidate for an implant placement at this point in her growth and development. And so it's my great pleasure to talk to you about something that's very dear to me, auto tooth transplantation. When it comes to tooth auto transplantation, one of the first questions is, is it predictable? And so in this landmark paper by Dr. Czakorska out in Poland, she did a, study with mean uh, observation time of 17 to 41 years. So observation time of 17 to 41 years and mean age of surgery was 11 and a half years old. And what did they find in the transplant teeth? They found that there was a 90% survival rate and a 79% success rate. 
And when you delve deeper into the success and survival, we see that in fact, the three teeth that were lost that decrease the success rate were lost after nine, 10 and 29 years. And furthermore, the two, two of them ankylosed and the other two just failed to meet the criteria for success. They were able to conclude though, that transplanted teeth do compare favorably in the long term with other treatment modalities. Now, even more recently, just this past issue of Journal of Periodontology, there was a study talking about utilizing wisdom teeth in first molar sites. And what we see here is that through their study, one second, essentially they had well, mean age of 30, uh, so 36 teeth were transplanted. One second, let me change this quickly here. So mean age of 30, 36 patients, observation period of 29 months, 26 of the teeth were fully erupted and 10 were non-erupted. And there was a 97% success rate, 90% uh, survival rate and 92% success rate. Out of the teeth that failed, one of them had an open apex and it had a five millimeter probing depth and they considered a failure because the crown to root ratio was less than one. And then the other tooth had a closed apex and they saw root replacement resorption. The beautiful thing about this study that I really liked is the fact that they actually took the time to have a patient reported outcomes. And the patient said, a majority of patients said they don't really recall the surgery and that it was a non-painful experience. So long story, less long is that tooth auto transplants when done appropriately do work. And so that last paper really emphasized the importance of a CBCT and using, utilizing a digital workflow. We were able to create a protocol of our own and we broke it down into three steps. So the first step is diagnosis. We emphasize this in the beginning of this presentation, but I'll emphasize it again. It's very important to take proper medical dental records, photos, extraoral, intraorals, intraoral photos, and radiographs and have that dialogue and discussion with the patient about the possible treatment options. If the patient is open to the idea of tooth transplantation, then we can begin with analog fabrication. And it's this part of the treatment sequence where CBCT is truly a game changer and allows us to provide this treatment with high precision and predictability for success. And then finally, we'll be discussing the surgical apps, uh, aspects of the procedure. So let's start with this patient. Well, what do we see? We already said that she has agenesis of her lower uh, premolars. And so when we have the discussion with the patient and her parents, we showcase this x-ray and we say essentially what we do is we take the donor tooth. In this case, since the root is already fully formed, uh, we begin by performing a root canal on the donor tooth. And then in the recipient site, we remove the hopeless primary teeth that were scheduled uh, treatment plan for removal anyways. And then we prepare the recipient site in a manner that I'll be touching upon briefly, but we could go into more detail that later. And then finally, as atraumatically and minimally invasive as possible, we remove the donor tooth. We, in this case, although the animation goes back and forth here, just purely rotating it, and you place it into the recipient site. The key things to keep in mind for the clinician is that what increases the probability of success is minimal extra oral time and minimal damage to the donor tooth. And so that brings me to the analog fabrication. We start off with a CBCT. And once we obtain the cone beam CT, and the reason we take a full view is to determine which tooth is the best recipient um, for the particular case. This CBCT is of a different patient where we were looking at wisdom teeth into the first molar site. But you can see with the software, free software, you can perform what's called image segmentation, which allows you to go through the different sections, coronal, axial, and sagittal to highlight the tooth that you want to transplant. And this renders an STL file, which you'll see in just a moment here. 
as we work through it, you add to it, you erase it. it. The whole process takes about five minutes. And then you can see on the bottom there, an SDL file, which we can then take to a printer and have it printed. And so here you can see those wisdom teeth being printed. The other thing, now this is the case of the 11 year old girl, we can not only 3D print it, but what we did in this particular situation is we milled it. And uh, I say we, Dr. Danny Gorgonoyu, uh, who's a perioprosthodontist, he and I worked on this case together. And so now we can see the overview of the surgical steps from start to finish. So we see the recipient site, we do the preparation, and then the analog confirmation. This is the longest part of the procedure. As you're trying in the analog, drilling some more as you need to, almost reverse engineering the socket. And the key thing here is back in the day before we had this accessible and available to us, if you were to have extracted the tooth already and keep trying it in and out, in and out, that would have caused damage to the PDL ligaments, increasing the chance of a resorption and decreasing the chance for success. And so after you get it to a point where the analog fits, we can proceed with the transplant extraction, insertion, suturing, and making sure that it's outside, uh, out of occlusion. So let's take a closer look at the case where we can see the extraction of the primary teeth, recipient site preparation using implant drills, and then using the analog to confirm whether or not we have enough space. Now, what we did in this particular case, we actually used the zirconia analog to help shape and change the cylindrical approach, cylindrical shape of the implant drills to one that's more conical and more uh, more similar to the actual root that we are going to be transplanting. And so here we, go, we see the recipient site, analog confirmation, and we took an x-ray just to make sure that we're at adequate length and that we are in the proper position. And so we can proceed with the extraction, removal of that little sealer puff there, and the total time outside of the mouth was 13 seconds. And so we place it into the socket, we adjust the occlusion, and we place a suture. In this case, we used a single figure eight suture over the transplanted site. And then when we see the immediate post-op compared to the pre-op, the real beauty is when we see it at one week and we can see significant healing. And at three months, it's as if, there was no surgery whatsoever. And it's hard to tell that that tooth doesn't belong there. At six months, we decided to begin orthodontic therapy and begin closing the space. And then here you can see an image of it at nine months. And the before and after photo of the most recent, photo, uh, most recent uh, recall visit. And we can see where that space is essentially closed and that that tooth Instead of keeping a space maintainer until she's old enough to get an implant, she has her own natural tooth in place. Now, photos don't always tell the whole story. We're looking at the top of the iceberg. And so let's take a closer look at the x-rays during the course of her treatment. So here we see the immediate pre-op and immediate post-op x-ray. What I want to draw your attention to is this area here where the primary tooth had the distal root. At three months, we see the formation of what appears to be a lamina dura. And then if we take a closer look, we can see how beautifully the PDL has healed in that site. Now, again, it appears like lamina dura, but in order to truly tell, we'd have to take histological samples, which would go completely counter to a lot of principles and what we want to do. And one way to tell though, we could do orthodontics. And since we already determined that she needs orthodontic therapy, at six months, we put the brackets and we wanted to introduce mesial root torque. And so you can see here after six months, when we updated her PA, we can see how the crestal bone has leveled off and also that the root apices have moved in a mesial direction. And so what are the take home points from this particular case. 
Now I'll tell you that PA is after two years of healing. And so very happy to say that that tooth has survived and succeeded. So for tooth auto transplantation, the CBCT really allows us to provide this treatment in a predictable fashion. It allows us to diagnose appropriately. And finally, to uh, finish today's presentation is that the CBCT and the digital workflow is not only the present, but the future of our profession. And so, as always, we want to remember to always be responsible and utilize what's available to us to provide our patient with the highest level of precision and care. Now, I did my best to cover as much as I possibly could in 45 minutes. And I could tell you, I could spend 45 minutes thanking each and every one, all the way from Henry Shine to my family and friends, all the people that are logged in today uh, to thank each and every one of you. And so I'll finish with this quote by George Burton Adams, who says, there is no such thing as a self-made man. We are made up of thousands of others. Everyone who has ever done a kind deed for us or spoken one word of encouragement to us has entered into the makeup of our thoughts as well as our success. So I thank you all for joining us tonight. And I look forward to answering any of the questions you have either here or you can feel free to uh, message me on Instagram at Dr. Dan Barant. And without further ado, Adam, we can open up the uh, chat for question and answers. Excellent. Thank you so much. I do want to say, I know you can't see the chat, but there are a lot of really great comments. So, okay. Great I'm job. excited. Thank <laughs> you so much. Let me see. Um, I think I can, uh... Yes, if you do it that way, you might be able to see it. Yeah. Um, just a reminder that we are offering CE for tonight's webinar. I did paste that in the chat. So if you want CE, it is required you complete that form. Um, let's see. I know we got a number of questions here. Um, is CBCT the standard of care if available, or is a traditional FMX still the standard baseline? That's uh, a great question. When it comes to standard of care, it really is treatment dependent. So if we're talking about implants, it is absolutely the standard of care if it's available to you uh, to be able to take a 3D x-ray so you can diagnose uh, appropriately. So for something like implants, I would say it's a standard of care. For other procedures, I think for endodontics, it's absolutely the standard of care when you're looking at molar. Uh, root canals. Again, I'm not an endodontist, so I would defer to my endo colleagues. Um, but in terms of standard of care for the regular patient, I don't think we've reached that level quite yet. All right. Uh, can you please repeat how much radiation is in an FMX? So in an FMX, again, it depends on different factors. It depends on uh, if it's digital or not digital, it depends on the size of the, of the cone itself. Based off of the five micro sieverts, um, an FMX would be, depending on how many single PAs and bite wings you take, you multiply that by five and that would give you an idea of how much is in an FMX. All right, we do have a lot of questions for anyone who is looking to get their question answered. Please, if you can, put it in the Q&A instead of the chat. Thank you. Um, is CBCT acceptable for insurance when they ask for images to cover services? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I do not know that. I think it would be case by case. I do know some insurance companies cover it, um, but I'm not sure if anyone else can answer that question about coverage for insurances. All right, we'll let that one simmer. Um, transplant timing after removing it and debride a non-restorable first molar to move a third molar to the site. Optimal age. Sorry, what, what's the, okay, here I can, there's the question I was looking at. Okay, transplanting timing after removing and debride a non-restorable first molar to move a third. Um, is that question asking, so essentially, I think this is the question, if there's a non-restorable first molar, 
you can extract it, you can clean out, curette the area, irrigate with saline, and transplant the exact same day. Um, the study that I mentioned discusses that and other studies as well about it's not as much about the recipient site as much as it is about how we handle the transplant itself. So in this case, optimal uh, optimal age, yes. Um, again, any any age, as long as you can visualize the molar, the ideal, I guess the optimal would be around 50 to 75% root formation. And then risk of ankylosis and not able to do ortho after transplant. Um, that's a great question. So risk of ankylosis really depends on the manner in which the site was prepared. And so the protocol that I was mentioning, if you're able to uh, create an adequate recipient site, that's one factor. So you do wanna lean towards larger than smaller. Secondly, how you extract the tooth. And so if you damage the root uh, surface, or the PDL, you increase the chance of ankylosis or root resorption, and also finally the time outside of the mouth. So whenever I do a case that requires the tooth to be out for longer, if I need to do adjustments of the, the crown in order for it to fit, uh, I'm soaking the tooth in Hanks Balance Salt Solution. So hopefully that answers that question. All right. Kevin Hart, how does an immature apex impact your treatment plan? I mean, if you remember that premolar of the first pan for the patient, I would have loved to do it then. In that case, I wouldn't have done the root canal and I would have allowed it to uh, do a vital tooth transplantation. What software did you use uh, and print analog tooth? So I think I can say blue sky. Bio is a software that I use to do the image segmentation. Uh, and then through there, you think there's a, a small fee you have to pay that allows you to take that STL uh, rendering of the transplant tooth. And then you, can, you download it to the computer that's connected to a 3D printer and go from there or 3D milling machine. How do you see CBCT fitting in the setting of an orthodontic office? Love this question. Um, again, if you have access to uh, a CBCT that is able to do the ultra low dose settings, I think it is uh, beneficial going back to the diagnosis that you're able to see the eruption sequence and also the communication with patients. I think it allows you to take more of a quarterback role when you have the information you're able to articulate with the artistry uh, of what you're finding, what you're seeing, and also with the patients to avoid um, unforeseen complications. And you know, there's cases that we could show where it appears to be a thick gingival, a thick periodontal phenotype, and the doctor did Invisalign and comes back four months later and the whole tooth is outside of the housing and significant recession. So I think if we had the access to a CBCT, it would have changed that. So I think uh, it is helpful in an ortho setting. Legal ramification if you take a CBCT for dental orthodox but not noticing a lesion. Yes, 100% legal. Uh, you are responsible for it. And so to go back to um, the legality side of things is if you can see it, you're responsible for it. Uh, in Dr. Sarver's textbook, he talks about a case where um, they missed uh, a diagnosis and they were sued for it and they had to pay because of it. And that's the last thing you want. Forget about the money, just the mere fact that we could have saved a patient from undergoing a surgery or improved their life. If you catch a tumor, heaven forbid, you know, that's what uh, is the most important thing. So you want to do your due diligence to make sure that it's uh, what CBC do you recommend and why? Um, so goes back to what you're using it for. So different CBCTs have different capabilities of field of view resolution. 
And so, again, it, it's a very case by case uh, situation. I am sure that someone at Henry Shine will be able to answer that question for you particularly. Uh, for me, because I am involved in um, sleep airway uh, discussions and orthodontic therapy and implants therapy and science lifts and full mouth rehabilitation, uh, I, I use uh, the iCAD and that allows me to see clearly and have an adequate field of view. What is that feature called to make the analog? It's called image segmentation. So I think that's both questions there. Uh, what's the next question? Adam, I miss your voice. I mean, if you want to hop on and start reading. You're, before, you're doing you're doing great. <laughs> I'm just um, waiting to see the participant numbers. If, if they start. Uh, I, oh, I just want to. We still got, I'm, we still I'm got so 200. Grateful. Yeah, we, we still got plenty of people on. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right, you guys. Um, thank you all for staying. I, I want to respect your evening. So, all right. Is there an optimal CBCT view which we can use to show the patient either vertical or horizontal bone loss? Um, so the sagittal view is usually the best one to show the vertical bone loss. Um, horizontal bone loss, again, you could show that, especially if you show them, you know, where the the CEJ is where you'd expect the bone to be if they have an area where they have healthy bone and use that comparatively. Uh, that's what I would recommend. So what is the maximum time for the tooth to be transplanted? And what is the best means to keep the tooth in if you cannot transplant immediately? Oh, thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, pleasure to see you here. And so the maximum time I believe the endodontic literature talks about 15 minutes. Um, I think it's actually 30 minutes, but for me, we wanted to keep it under 15 minutes. And so the best media is Hank's Balance Salt Solution, which um, as long as you soak that in there, I think it would uh, increase that 15 minute time span. Does the type of Field of view give you different view of what can be happening at different level of sample crowds or pay apical releases. Um, so the field of view, again, in the factors of the CBCT settings, the field of view is one of them, and also the resolution that you use. So when if you're suspecting a crack, which is very hard to diagnose on a CBCT, um, depending on the way it's cracked, you'd want to use a smaller field of view with higher resolution. Uh, for a periapical radiolucency, um, again, I think depending on how advanced the radiolucency is, I think you'd be able to still capture it on a lower to moderate um, resolution setting. So hopefully that answers that question. When do you need a TMJ scan and do all machines have it? So um, I don't think all machines have it in the sense that not all machines are capable of going back to the TMJ. Um, when do you need it? Um, I always listen to the patient first. So get as much information by discussing and talking with the patient. If you notice anything during the extra oral examination, clicking, popping, uh, deviation, pain the reports uh, by the patient, then we can consider that. Again, when it comes to the TMJ, um, I'm by no means a specialist in it. So if, if that is the situation, we would take it and then I'll send it out to um, a specialist that he and I or she and I can discuss further about the best course of treatment. All right, very quickly, I will say, we got a couple of responses back to the CBCT and insurance. Okay. Um, one answer said most insurances will not cover CBCTs and another response said it's about 50-50. So just putting that out there. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. People are working in the back and I was just stalling time here. Uh, all right. So does a CBC reformatted PAN and lateral CEF give you better treatment outcomes than the 2D CEF and PAN in conventional? Brilliant question. No, I don't think it gives you better treatment outcomes because that's dependent on the orthodontic rendering the treatment. Um, if you go, if I, I mean, I could go back to that, um, the amount of radiation in 
uh, different sections with the ultra low dose. So if we, can you guys see it? Yeah, right, I'm still sharing the screen so people can still see it. Yes. So in some of these situations, by taking a full uh, low dose, ultra low dose CBCT, it does give you the information at a lower dose than a conventional CBCT. Um, but I would not say that you need a CBCT to provide the highest quality of care in the majority of cases. Um, I mean, that, that's another interesting thing to briefly mention, because uh, I know there is some work being done at University of Pennsylvania. You know, our standards for cephalometric uh, values are based on a 2D Ceph. We're trying to expand that uh, and understanding in terms of growth and development as well. How, how this happens in a three-dimensional and different uh, values uh, aside from the 2D norms that we're looking at. Do wisdom teeth need to be fully erupted to use them as first molars? No, they do not. So uh, had we had more time, I could have shown you some cases where we had uh, wisdom teeth that were uh, soft tissue impacted. And so the, the key thing is, is if you can get to the wisdom tooth without damaging, uh, the apex or the apical papilla or the root surface, then you're able to do that. So it's a little bit difficult with fully bone impact, like full bone impacted uh, wisdom teeth, but it's still possible. Are there any resources for team members to learn how to interpret CBCT, especially hygiene for SOP tree lines? Wonderful. Um, definitely. Uh, I will defer that to Henry Schein because I know there's a lot of information on their website and different webinars available. Um, also, Cone uh, Beam Readers had uh, some information there. Different online programs like Dental XP uh, is a great resource for uh, learning and familiarizing yourself with CBCTs. If you have any questions, again, just message me and I can help you as much as I can and also uh, guide the learning. Loads yes, and we, we also do have lots of CBCT resources. Um, if you wanna go talk with a rep, email webinars at henryshine.com, I'll put you in touch. Otherwise, like Dr. Grant said, we have tons of on-demand content, articles, and so forth. So we have those resources for you. Perfect. Those are for the ICANN. Um, the low dose protocol. So these numbers, I don't believe they were for their ICAT. They were for a different system. But again, talk to the rep that you're buying your CBCT from and then get, they have those values for you. And again, even those values, there's so many different factors in terms of like the patient density and the growth and the size that would impact it. But it gives you a good idea of the amount of radiation that you're exposing the patients to. Our root canal therapy. Oh, um, no, they're not. So traditionally, um, I don't know if this was recorded. So that popped up. So traditionally, what would happen is the transplant would be done. Then two weeks later, they would do the root canal. When we approach the situation, I felt that it makes more sense to do the root canal inside the mouth. And the reason we did the root canal was because the patient was not, again, um, the, the parent of the patient, I should say, because she was a young girl, was not very responsive and in the beginning reliable. And so it was very difficult to like, you know, a lot of missed appointments, a lot of can last second cancellations. And in the adolescent population, if resorption begins, it can occur very quickly. And so one of the things that maybe I didn't drive home is, in my personal opinion, the key to success is adequate follow-up uh, with tooth transplantation. So patient, 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 it's one of the biggest things for success. And so it's not always necessary to do the root canal. Um, and you can decide to monitor it. Please can you show logos? Yes, I can. And I will expand it for you. Is this the one you were looking for? Now, Adam, are, do they see the they see the full screen, right? I only see the Q and A. Yep, full screen. Okay, so they don't see that I'm looking at the Q and A now. No, nope. perfect. Is that good? I think 
That was good. Yes, perfect. Good. <laughs> Happy. I think you knocked them out. I, I don't know if we got to all the questions, but you you answered your fair share, that's for sure. Perfect. Perfect. Cool. Any last, uh, any final parting words for those sticking on with us? I just want to thank you guys. This has been such a fun opportunity. I hope you learned something. I hope it was entertaining. Uh, I know when I was studying radiology, that wasn't always the most riveting topic, but the platform that Henry Shine provides is perfect to uh, create an interdisciplinary discussion. So I thank you guys all. I hope you have an amazing evening. Get home safely. Enjoy your night. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me anytime. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brandt, once again. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We did record tonight's webinar, so we'll get that out to you sometime in the next week. And again, any questions, webinars at henryshine.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thank you.